A conversation with Andy Seaborn recorded live at the Atlassian office in San Francisco on June 24th, 2010. So I tend to, people say, say I tend to mumble. This is going to be exaggerated by my accent as well. So if you're having trouble here, just say so. Um, also, there aren't many of us, but anyway, ask questions because during while I go on, because I can deviate from the slides and just talk about whatever you want to talk about. I have some material, but there's no sense that I even need to get through the stuff. So this is a conversation, not a, not a lecture. So this is what I was going to cover. Let you know where Jenner is. If you don't know what Jenner is, just say, we'll look at a picture. Talk about a bit about where Sparkle is and Sparkle 1.1, where that's going. And talk about TDB, which is one of the Jenner stores. That, uh, the one that's currently uh, used by IBM, actually. And Jazz Framework. So, um, that's where we are now. The machine is actually a very small server sitting in EC2, actually. Um, we used to have a very big server, because when we, when we were back in HP days, it was some massive, great, four-way server with more memory than nothing was ever actually used for the filing system. Uh, so when we left HP, the lawyers took one look at, at, at our licensing and roughly said, hmm, it's BSD, we can't stop you doing anything anyway. Um, but actually the, the company's been pretty good about um, us taking on all the copyrighted material. I mean the material is still copyright HP, but um, if we wanted to consolidate the license together under some other banner then I think it would be a slow but a fairly positive process to actually do that. So the company hasn't been too bad about it, so there's no animosity going on there. But so we have taken everything really. We, we took the, um, the whole kitchen sink and everything else. Um, this was kind of the picture we've used before, um, back, and I think everything is really not all the areas are completely active, um, but we've actually, all, uh, all the stuff we've seen was under the same licensing system, so we've continued with that. So I'll, I'll quickly go through some of the ones that you may But So this is the core system that you're probably more familiar with. Um, uh, the abstraction in the middle between storage, the inference, the, the application APIs through there. So the RDF one, the ontology one, the Sparkle one input from the readers and the writers and then the storage engines but there's also a number of peripheral things that w w we also have had in the past so squirrel rdf is a very simple mapper between um, uh, relational data and and uh, rdf data um, some of the technology from that is actually now in d2rq the initial because it one of the things it does do is it takes a look at the database and makes some initial guesses on a, on a schema mapping um, so that you're not starting from a blank sheet of paper, you get a mapping of a fairly basic tables into RDF. It's probably not a very good conceptual mapping, but at least you've got something to start with and you can actually do some more refinement. We have a, a, a Griddle um, system that's actually quite active and it's going to be doing another lease. So that Griddle is the process of taking XML documents with some Griddle annotation and some styling and producing RDF. So it's one of the ways of getting um, RDFA fits into that framework. But there's also an RDFA reader which is not on this picture because it was written quite recently. Close is a way of looking at um, XML data uh, lifting it up into the RDF domain and going back again without, without information loss. That's actually gone to a company called Close Limited um, and there's a guy, the guy who wrote it, has uh, started up a little, little activity around that and uh, is now contracting to uh, Cleveland Clinic um, because they have a lot of um, uh, lots, a lot of XML records data and they want to process it in various ways. So he's contracting to them. Um, Eyeball is the, uh, our, our sort of version of Lint for RDF. It allows you to write some configuration um, files and actually say what sort of validation reports you want to do on your RDF data, since RDF itself is never really very invalid, but the probably higher level assumptions that you want to check to make, because you know from your domain data that it's more, more uh, uh, expected like that. Um, the UI work isn't really the ones that are active, so we've done a um, data integration portal as part of an EU project some years ago and an RDF browser um, which is called Brown Source, if you're not, then it's a British joke, HP Source, HP is a, um, maybe a computer manufacturer around here but it's actually a manufacturer of condiments in the UK. Um, <laughs> And then there's Giuseppe and the distributed version of, of that, which is dark. That's not, that's the student who did that, has uh, continued that work. So it's not really um, active in the gender framework, but it, it is still going along. And that's the part that actually 
um, kicked off the idea of service in Sparkle because he needed the basic building block. What it, that system does is it actually analyzes the Sparkle query and decides where each of the parts should go and the service keyword and, and, the, and the things and I'll, I'll come to in a moment give you the ability to actually build those queries and actually execute them. So we are still alive. Um, that's the message that Brian sent out uh, so August 2000. The that was the first announcement of Jenna outside of, of HP Labs. That was the, uh, that's kind of what we take to be the, the beginning. Um, the URL doesn't work, which is really a shame. It'd be quite uh, all, all this talk about cool URIs and not changing. It'd be quite amusing if the actual <laughs> place that he jumped to file all those years ago actually was still there, but it's not. I'm, tr I'm trying to recover the contents as we try and as we as we um, uh, get to uh, to August to so see if I can collect all the releases of Jenna that they've ever been and put them together. The old ones, we were much more, um, less disciplined in our uh, software processes would be the politest thing to say about what it is like. Then nowadays, you know, everything's on SourceForge, everything's carefully tagged and everything. Back then it was more of a case of, oh yeah, I've done, you know, the release has been done and some of the files might have version numbers on them and uh, it's not quite clear what actually went in and repositories weren't tagged or anything like that. Uh, but that was a long time ago. It's also quite small. Um, nowadays it's quite a lot bigger, but then we tend to ship all the binaries that the system depends on rather than having the user do the integration. So that was 10 years ago. Um, we're now roughly that and still doing releases. We've done releases since we've left HP. Um, all, this, all, all the major components have, have gone through at least one release or are actively very close to it. And we actually did a full release of Jenna, but that, so that kicks off every, everything else to try to just catch them up. Um, the active areas are, are, are really around, mainly around TDB, this storage here, and I'll talk a bit about that later on. That's the key, key areas, I think, is getting some development effort at the moment. The rules has had quite a lot of, well, it's more than just maintenance going on. Um, that's been an area where people have been quite interested because of the RIF work, so, um, there's, uh, if there's ever a you know, standards work going on or, or, or things about it, or the, the parts of gender that have some relationship to it tend to sort of become an attractor. I don't know whether university professors are setting coursework related to it because it looks trendy at the time or something like that. So rules work has tended to be quite active recently. I mean, rules requests have been quite active recently because of the, the RIF work. So we're still alive, we're still going. But we're now an open source project in the, in the true sense. Um, we, will, we work for different companies, so some of, some of, some of the contributors left a few years ago, um, we've all left now. So it also means we can take contributions. <laughs> we still have a BSD license, um, we now have a multi-copyright uh, code base. Um, there's about 12 different copyright holders I guess overall now. 90% of it is, is HP, um, but Talis has got contributions in it, Epimorphics, the startup that a number of the other people did, contributions that we've had over the years, um, there's IBM copyright material in there in a couple of places, and various other bits and pieces. We've been quite good actually, fortuitously actually tracking all, the, all our contributions and making sure attribution is in there, um, so that, that worked out quite well. Um, but we can take contributions, so regard this as a big hint. Um, send things to our patch tracker, um, that means we can track it. And now we're, we're outside, we're going to be a lot more careful about the, the legal issues around, around that. What's your business model? I mean, Sorry? What's the business model? Sorry. For Jenna? How do you make money if you're taking contributions as opposed to the dual? There's, there's no business model, there's no money involved here. Uh, uh, it, it's pure open source BSD, you can use it for whatever you want, you don't need to attribute to us at all. None of, the, none of the companies, the only people I know that offer commercial support for Jenna um, are there's a company called Intervise that does it because they do a lot of government contracts in the US um, and actually provide the support that goes with that and Oracle. Um, they, they will give Jenna technical support, yes, because of um, the, some, of the, some of the users, particularly the life sciences community use the Oracle um, system, um, RDF system through the Jenner adapter that they produce and as part of that they, they need to support, support Jenner. 
it wasn't done with any any we have no connection with that activity we don't get any money for instance um, and then needs do we actually have to answer any questions and it's, it's quite open for some some company to set up a support model around Jenna there's nothing stopping them um, none of the contributors are interested in doing it as far as I know this is more something it kind of that's how it kind of started off as we were working semantic web stuff we needed a base platform to do the grungy bits like read the formats in and store the triples and then build the interesting applications over the top. So we started putting all those bits we were with Kit together and that's what seeded the start of Jenna and it's continued like that. And with us all moving to commercial ventures that are doing RDF stuff, um, it could well continue quite happily like that for quite some time. Um, we would love more help. Um, if. If, if and if major customers, users want um, particular features in it, well, we can have a discussion about how that's going to get resourced. But there's no business model going in, in around it. And as far as I know, nobody's any intention of starting one up. How many people are working on it? Oh, what's the right? Being open source, there's no clear answer to the question. There's a kind of, the core team that kind of, you consider to be the owners, I guess, is about 10 people, some of whom are not technical at all, some of the, like, some of the manager who, it was, it was in the umbrella in the organisation, we said, you know, please keep in touch because, you know, get advice on, that, on how to deal with things and stuff like that. Um, so if, if you were asking the question how much active effort is going in at the moment, um, maybe one full-time equivalent going on at the moment, but, you know, it, you know, uh, among, uh, spread along, amongst a number of people, um, so, you know. There, there's no uh, project plan. There's no, um, you know, agreement on time scales or things. We tend to because we now we've got a, a large base. There's, there's maintenance going on, on it all all the time. The small things are getting changed. Like I couldn't track how much time is going on on that. You just find find things turn up in CVS from the committers. Um, so. Uh, that, that, I mean, I'm so, I don't know, I know about the product, but not the politics, and of course I'm more interested in the politics, like most human beings. <laughs> you know, it's all, it's all the soap operas, the interesting bit at some level. Um, but what's the, who's, who's controlling the contributors and stuff like that? Is it, who's the, are you the lead kind of like, you know, I'm a, scrutinator uh, of what happens? And what it's, it's, it's consensus agreement amongst the list. We probably have a sort of, we have the, uh, informally, there's no agreement on how it is. It, effectively, it's a lazy consensus. Yeah. People say, "Let's do this," yeah. and then you get you, you know. There's on, on usually in the public list, or, uh -huh. or and we got we do have a private list for for when we're discussing <laughs> <laughs> what to do yeah, about really working with, working with HP and there's some things we can't really talk about naming company names or right. particularly users. You know, we don't know if they want us to talk about this stuff in public. Right. Yeah. Um, you can object to that point, but if you don't object, you can just consider that it's going to go ahead right. and, and happen. But most of the system, because um, it is quite a quite large code base now, most of it is just in maintenance mode, right. and there's nothing to do to it. Like any stuff, it'd be nice to go in and tweak it and make it pr prettier or right. a little bit better with, a, with the um, hindsight of, of using it, but it doesn't really need that. So there's, there's a few areas of sort of active work, but most of it's just 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 works. Right. Um, we're very loath to change interfaces because of the uh, um, catastrophic effect, both on internally work on the team, right. but also on all the all the users. Um, we never remove functions from the interface. We might we might deprecate them and say they're not a good idea, but we realise that people take years to upgrade. Now it, it doesn't happen very quickly, so you get requests from stuff that you're thinking you're using this actively and you haven't been upgrading. Well, you're taking a bit of a risk, aren't you? You know, it's an open source project. But using two-year-old versions is kind of weird. Um, yeah. uh, I mean, we've seen some lot of issues around. Yeah, it, it, it's it's not a, a clear-cut thing, but um, you, particularly enterprise users, they can't just pick up every single increment because each one is signed off. For, for use, so they tend to move in big jumps a few years at a time, or when they hit a part of the system, they need to pick up the new stuff, and otherwise they don't upgrade at all. So a bit of an interlude. I was going to talk a little bit about what's happening in Sparkle 1.1. Who knows what the working group is currently doing and is 
will know everything I could say about it. Well, no. <laughs> you, you lead the work. No, no, I'm, 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 the, I'm, one of the, I'm a co-editor on the query language specification and I'm a contributor to the update stuff. That, that's formally what I do. I'm, I don't chair working groups. <laughs> that would be far too stressful. So if I'm saying stuff you all know, then fine. I, I haven't got anything on to market itself. So the, the working group is actually there to kind of finish what you should have done the first time. There's a number of things that are kind of complete in the query language. There's lots of so subquery and aggregates are kind of fairly natural things to want to do, and they just didn't get done last time because we ran out of time. Um, there are some new stuff. Property paths and the federated query is is kind of new on on, on the radar. But there's a whole bundle of other stuff that's not related to query. Um, service description, um, being able to write down the, uh, what the capabilities of Sparkle endpoints are in such a way that um, you can have a program understand and choose amongst alternatives what vocabularies are supported at a given point, maybe what extensions and features are offered at that point, what graphs are available there. Being RDF for the description, surprisingly enough, you could put all sorts of information there like licenses on the data or, or all sorts of things. Um, service description service uh, available. So. So each endpoint has its own service description. There isn't a concept of a central repository. But your application is going to have to go and uh, review each one? Um, yes, but if that becomes important, I think, if you look at the World Wide Web architecture, nowhere does it say search engine. That's an emergent effect because it's valuable to have things that go around and but pick up web pages. It, yeah. It uh, yeah. supersedes uh, that arrangement. So you could see the same thing happening here. If you want to get, create aggregations, okay. going around, read all those things, that will emerge. But there's no reason why it needs standardizing. There's nothing stopping that happening. You could write a service today you know, that goes around crawling the web, looking for service descriptions, and builds up a database, sure. puts recommendations around it, allows you to, for people to annotate that, saying that worked really well, or yeah, they got this database, but it's a little bit out of date, and all that sort of thing. What, the, what needs to be standardized is from really basic vocabulary that you can build that service description around, so everyone has got the, the, the lightweight integration frame framework and then you can add what sort of information on top of it that, that you want to. Okay. Federated query, up, updates, two forms of update, um, an HTTP form which you know putting and getting whole graphs um, into, into a graph store on the web so you can just post your, your RDF graph at something or do a get on it, control your graph store with curl um, and then a fine grained language to actually change and manipulate the data within a store in a standard way. It, yeah, we're looking at the rest, so we're, we're really saying it seems a bit a bit heavy to say that it's some formal specification. We're really just codifying the fairly obvious things to do with the rest verbs and just what does it mean when you apply it to a graph. Little more than just trying to create consensus about how you name a graph in a graph store. Once you've got that, post does um, sends triples into, into a graph, um, put will overwrite the, tri the, the, the information in, in a graph, delete will get rid of it, um, get will fetch it, all, all the, you know, the rest style operations would apply to it. And then you've got the container, which is the graph store, the collection of name graphs that are going together. So will that be included in Um uh, At some time, I, I, would, I would put that into Giuseppe or someone will. Um, it's not, the hesitancy is, it's really not very hard to implement. It's, it's not some big spec. It's just defining Actually, the only bit really that it adds is how to name the um, uh, to name the grass within a store. I think I, have, I think I might have a slide on that later. If not, yeah, then come back to it. As far as getting tripped up, was that it's uh, is it really part of the quench? No, no. Sparkle was, was always Sparkle 1.0 three things. It's the query language, it's the result set format, and the protocol for being able to invoke the operations over the web. Um, okay, the query is by far the largest part of that. So Sparkle is that whole bundle. Okay. So oh, I've just got a bunch of examples. Um, so aggregation group by very SQL-like. Um, so count all the, the things that match that and assign it to the variable C, group by, and a nested query. So what's this one doing? This is finding the smallest name alphabetically um, of, of this 
of all the names for given people and then find uh, join that with the uh, people that Alice knows and see what you get out of that. Um, that is the example in the spec for, for doing it. That's a subquery. So you, what the, it's a subquery because you've got the word select inside the inside that that pair of brackets there. Um, uh, so you can do the Sparkle one O only did one level of processing. So you know you do a pattern match, you do the grouping, you do the selection modifiers, and you can use that inside another query. And then you can build up the layers of select, project, join type of queries that um, that you know you have in the relational the algebra. Visa, I mean, it's a good question, but uh, you can't select a different model in the sub. Um, you can't change the data set that you're querying inside that. You can pick a different graph out of the data set by using the graph keyword. You can do that from top to bottom. Um, what you can't do is completely switch the data set, but really there's no good reason for not starting off with the data set of all graphs anyway and naming the ones that you, you want. Now, we did discuss that one, did actually come up and, and we had some discussion around that. You can construct um, uh, example use cases where it would be good to be able to do that but on balance yeah, yeah, yeah. it has also has a lot of complications because um, uh, the whole idea of query optimization against a single store has now been thrown out the window and there's a lot of existing technology and understanding for, for that so these cases weren't sufficiently motivated to motivating to put that in property paths is the one for um, which enables you to do the uh, closures over um, over the graphs. The first the first example is just the ability to say a more a more um, com, uh, s selective syntax. So that says um, the people the names of the people uh, known by exme. So it, 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 if you could imagine that there's there's a variable in there, so, and then there's a triple to there, and then a triple to there. Um, and it's just more, succ uh, more succinct syntax for putting that in. In fact, the semantics of that is exactly as it would be for its expansion into pure triples. This one is much more like, this is regex-like. So this is x, find its RDF type, and then follow any one or more uh, R, um, subclass relationships. So this is trying to find things that are... Uh, if it was if it was a star in there, follow any number. You'd have the normal RDFS subclass thing. You, uh, by putting a plus in here, star is legal. By putting a plus in here, you want to find the things that are not. You've actually excluded the possibility of its con uh, declared type because you've got to have at least one level of subclass relationship in the hierarchy to get to. Um, so the inverse of that is um, um, all direct subclasses. The real thing that's going on is the change of balance of of power between the data provider and, and the application writer. When you've got an inference system sitting underneath your graph, it's the data publisher who's exposing those inferred relationships and they're in control about what you can do. With property paths, you're giving the application writer to put some degree of request and processing ability into the query to say, actually, I want to view this in a more RDFS-like way, even though you, original data provider, didn't provide that, and, and the query engine um, provides that. In the Sparkle where clause, or...? Yes, this would be in the where clause. Okay. Yeah, so these are... Uh, where you can have anywhere, anywhere you can have a triple pattern. You can, you can have a complex property path. Um, the bottom one is the way to access all the members in a, of an RDF list. So that is follow all N zero or more next properties and then hop off at the first one going down the console cell list. This doesn't quite do access to lists because it doesn't necessarily come out in order and the important thing about list is usually that it's in order. If you have a bunch of academics, um, the first name author is a significant piece of information on that list. Um, maybe less in, in, in some other things, but they you know when you when you look at all those citations, do you know that where they are on the list is a piece of information that, that tells you something about them, without changing a lot of Sparkle to preserve order, because hardly anything else preserves order in Sparkle. Um, there was no way that you can actually provide that. Um, I, Arc has some ways of accessing the list and to also get the index of where you are on the list. So if you if you then sort by the index, that you can actually um, restore the order again. Um, but the working group's just providing this. At least 
uh, and it works very well in the L situation because lists in L actually the order doesn't matter when you say it's a restriction of these classes. It's just using it as a closed set of values where order hasn't mattered. Um, so that will mean that you can write patterns that access ontologies. Um, it, it's quite, it has been quite an interesting debate in the working group because the, this is this is kind of much more algorithmic ways of specifying things um, rather than declarative. You can write some very, very ex expensive in, in, uh, expressions over the data very succinctly. So some people get very nervous at this point. Um, I think they will be fairly, the a good take up on that. Because I'm not a yeah. database guy, but do they have list operations as well, or is that just sort of implicit in the rows coming out? And it's implicit in the rows. In, in SQL there isn't a list right. type, and right. you can only return things that are in the native data model as any atomic values. Yeah. You can have lists in uh, sequences in XML. Yeah, it, yeah, everything's much more sequence orientated, but yeah. in SQL, no. And this is reminiscent of XPath. Yes, yeah, or regular expressions over properties. Uh, you know, it's all that sort of thing. It's not. It, the, it's much more like regular expressions. It isn't as, as powerful as um, or varied as as, as Xbox, But then we don't have attributes and, and nested elements and all that yeah, sort of thing. So yeah, it, it is very much that that feel. So I think extensions to prolog, you know, the idea of declarative programming, and then all the extensions that get snuck in by the you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I wouldn't be surprised if some of the larger stores decide not to do that. If your store has already got inferencing, then it's going to be better to have access its inferencing rather than doing it through property, property paths. Does um, this give you kind of a, an option that you can use it for data that is referred to frequently and effectively it's a kind of caching mechanism, but for you could you could you do that yes you could actually look at analyze the pattern and worked out whether you effectively have, have already pre-calculated and do it a different strategy yeah it would be quite an interesting thing to do negation one of the most controversial issues so we have two ways of doing that that one says uh, so f find me all the, the, the fourth persons and remove the ones where they're it, the, there does not exist a FOF name. I th actually, just, I forgot the from filter. So not it, yeah, it's removing it's removing the case where there is no FOF name declaration. So it looks at the pattern and then says if you so it's, the, the filter is true if it doesn't match. Um, so it, 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 it's equivalent to the optional not bound trick that you can do in Sparkle 1.0, but it's much more succinct. And there's also an exists as well. Um, so that makes those kind of uh, validation kind of queries much more sensible. Uh, in the OWL and the Clark and Parsia presentation today, they were generating queries with not exists in, because uh, testing from, with, with OWL, you can actually deduce there must be an individual or such that certain properties, so you can check your data um, by, uh, by doing exists queries against the database. Um, that's another form. One of the reasons well, the group didn't really realise this until quite late on, is there's just two fundamentally different paradigms about ways of thinking about negation. It's either does this pattern match against the graph, or am I removing one set of results from another set of results that I'm already processing on? And one of the reasons we weren't getting much traction on a consensus agreement is while some of the time those two, th those two viewpoints will agree on what the results are, there are other times where you don't agree. So all the cases, well, you can't do this and you, can, you can't do this particularly easy or something like that. So in the end, the only co the compromise position was to have both these forms. So this is a little bit more like the SQL minus, although we don't have, we, we think so. So that says, read that one, just find all the people, then remove all the X's such, um, such that the fourth name matches. So it's an, it's an anti-join, if you know your rational al algebra. Gives a difference? Um, in this case, you will get the same answers, but you can construct other queries where you'll get different answers. The minus has got a slightly odd definition in Sparkle. Federated query, ability to go somewhere else to um, uh, satisfy part of the query. This is actually taken from Eric Pridamo's work with the Life Sciences Working Group. Um, so this is actually a real query as part of one of the demonstrators. So f in this part, you're actually trying to find a service endpoint and put it in service. So you're finding all the 
endpoints that service that have information about this gene, I think is what it reads as, and then you go and query it. So you say service, which really just means do a select um, Sparkle query of this pattern on the serv whatever's in the service variable at the time. So it goes and finds the endpoint that it wants to go and talk to, and then goes and um, sends a re this re part of the request off to that endpoint, and then pulls the information back together again. So it's a matter of being able to reach out to other Sparkle endpoints um, during query execution. That one's been, um, so we've, we've done a certain amount of um, communication around the features that are coming along. That one gets a lot of positive reaction, actually. When it first came up, it, it, when I did it first, first a few years ago in, in, in Arc, it didn't get much traction, nobody used it, it was kind of an odd feature, most people didn't even find the documentation about it. Um, there's much more of a sense of semantic web now, so the web features get, have got a lot more attention I think in the last couple of years, which is a good sign that it, it isn't just a, a, a weird way of writing bizarre databases. So Federation, there was no federated query capability for you could the only thing you could do is in the from clause in a Sparkle query, you could go and grab a remote graph, but you'd actually have to give it a direct name. You couldn't, halfway through a query, decide, ah, oh, it's that graph over there that I actually want to go and query. Um, So you can do that here without using for, from, is that? Yeah, it, the service sends another Sparkle query off to the end, and the endpoint over the, over the protocol. But you already requires a from uh, statement, right? Yeah, and, you'd, you'd, and then you pull the graph back at that point. So this, supposing that graph is like a couple of billion triples, whereas this might select a few hundred rows from it. But there's a fundamentally big difference of what goes on at oh, scale from, in this. From, from will get the whole graph, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and this will only this returns the results of matching that pattern. Okay. Uh, at the, so it takes that pattern, throws it over to the remote end, and asks it to execute, and then just gets the results back. Oh, yeah. this is it would be in that case, yeah. Where's the URL of the service? You get, so you mean how do you find out what that is? Yeah. But that's what this part is doing. This is a Sparkle pattern that says, uh, find me um, about genes. Oh. So here, it's looking in the local data to find the, from the endpoints. So if you think the local data is a manifest of all the services you know about, and then it's finding the ones that do this or that, um, the, the in keyword is a Sparkle 1.1. So you the address of the endpoint in the query itself? Yes. Yeah so, yeah, so you're looking at your local, your local graph deciding which endpoints you want to go to and then actually going to it. Or several endpoints, it doesn't have to be a single, a single result. If there's two, two matches for service, it'll go to two places. Not all engines are going to implement this. I mean, ones that are sitting behind firewalls are not going to start calling out onto the wild web. Yeah, sort of a stupid question, but authentication in this framework or anything like that, that's just going to be handled in terms of the, whatever the... Whatever you get, yeah. yeah. Uh, there is very little use of Sparkle over SOAP. I, I don't know. Of, of a, there might be some inside enterprises. Um, I have removed the, spoke, the soap support in Giuseppe, mm -hmm. and nobody has ever even mentioned it. Um, this is basically intranet and in, inside. Yeah. It's so but, all, all, the, all the use of, of Sparkle is over HTTP direct in, in practice. So you, you can tell what that's, that's going to be. So yeah, yeah try to keep away from those security framework issues because otherwise we're inventing a little microcosm of our own and not using all the other building blocks that there are around and of course there's, there's stack, stacks of stuff. Transactions is another good one in, in that thing. It's not that they're a bad idea, it's the fact that you know, there are transaction frameworks out there, let's work out how to fit in them, not add features to the language to do it. Update language, um, that, that, so this one deletes all the, all the names of, of this person and adds, adds one in. So the, the key thing here is there are two operations inside one single request. Um, there are more complicated manipulations you can do on the graph. You can say in, in, insert 
uh, delete the things from this template, insert from this, from this template where here's something that matches the graph. So like a super duper construct that actually modifies the data. Um, but it means you can have a standard way of actually updating it. And you have to take care of the security issues. Do not put general purpose update endpoints on the wild web with no security on. <laughs> well, you to say that, um, there's an example in the Joseki config file how to set it up. People just install that config file without looking at it. Fortunately, by default, I commented it out. But that's the only thing that's stopping. Otherwise, when people run the things that uh, are copied the server up, they're putting up an, um, an update endpoint without realizing it. Right. So, so just those common characters in that line are the only thing that's stopping it happens. So need to be careful. There will be in Sparkle one one. Yeah, but it but it is two two languages. It's it's not quite the SQL setup where there is one language which does both query and update. Think of them as two languages, and it will with two language protocols. So there's two protocols for dealing with it. When you do an update, you don't get any results back. You can't mix select queries with update requests and same thing. So you don't get the injection attack situation. We'll keep them very separate. So if you do update, you don't get a response back. You just get yes or no back saying it happened or it didn't happen. If you want to do something more sophisticated, you're going to have to go and query the endpoint and see what's in it. Yeah, it, it, it. So to remove data, you actually have to create a third process that's running a select from a source. Well, you can you can put you can put something you put send templates over. You have a where clause, so you can get that that kind of select uh, select query going. What you can't do is sort of get results returned back from the from the update. Yeah, that's what I mean. So, yeah. Can you have an update and a select as part of the same query? You can. Um, there's nothing to write on here. You can have a where clause um, on an insert. You can say insert this, and then you give a template, a pattern, like like one of those, where, so it's just like a construct query in Sparkle, except the results get put back into the data source, so it, it's feeding back like that. You can do the same with delete as well, so you can actually do that. What you can't do is return a results table back from an update operation, or in the middle, or nest inside a select query, an update operation. Okay. HTTP update, so the, the, we're, this is the bit where we're at only, it's the usual verbs. Yeah. Vanilla interpretation, we aren't rewriting somebody else's standards. The only thing really that's happening is how do you name the graphs in a store? So the most obvious one is the usual container model that RSS or Atom has. You know, you've got a store and then local names for that are just extensions of, 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 of the path name. The only thing we need to do more than that is the fact that a store may be holding a, a graph that has a name that is not rooted under the container. So here's the store, and the graph I'm talking about is, is, is this one here. So this is the named graph, HTTP examples G1, inside that store. Only what actually goes on the wire is this much more messy thing, because these are meta characters in HTT, um, HTTP URLs, so they have to be encoded off the planet to make things read, um, legal but and unreadable. So that's really what that standard has to add, is the agreement on that naming of things within the store. Once you've got that, it's the usual REST operations performing exactly as they would do. When you do post, it adds triples into the graph, appends. And it, 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 so in, in the store, if, if, your, your, if your store is a, a table of quads, yes, that's setting the G column to do that. But it, you know, your store might be implemented as a collection of, of graphs, and each graph in a file. There's no reason we couldn't do that. You could, could do, you can't tell. It's the service that's on the outside that matters. Okay, that's just a... That's all I have on the, on Sparkle one one. I haven't. There's there's more that the, the working group's got quite a lot of documents on the go. Defining entailment regimes, which is using the, the extension point there is in Sparkle one zero, but getting more formal about what it means to query RDFS, particularly avoiding the situation where you get infinite answers, which if you behave naively, you 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 would do what it means in OWL. Just a quick question. The rules interchange format is a W three C recommendation now, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so, did you say you're going to implement that in Java? No. Um, I don't know of anybody who's planning on, on doing that. RIF isn't a rules language. 
RIFI's uh, rules interchange format framework, I think, or one or the other. It allows you to communicate rules between rule systems. Um, Dave might well do a general rules to RIF and back again system that might be useful. We've, we've done some work with a, a, a different rules language which is more sparkle syntax based um, and we could we could do mappings between RIF and and, and, and those rules like rules languages but it isn't itself a set of uh, a rules engine or, or an algorithm that, um, that uh, so think of it more as the external serialization of the rules not as a, as a rules language in, in itself. Hopefully it'll happen sometime. Um, quite a lot of the work goes on in the UK is related around government data, so things like processing and cleaning up the data. Well, even once it's in RDF, you want to turn it into other RDF. So I can see some work on rules happening if we can find somebody to um, either provide the time or the money uh, to do that. I'm not planning on doing it, but um, there are other people. <laughs> what? Working on the rules part of the yeah, we've had a rules engine. That's how we get our inference support. Is it active, active area? Yeah, fairly active, yes. It, it, uh, yeah. What I am spending my time on is, is this, this thing. But first, I did one before, which was a mapping to SQL. This is the translation. That's the SQL that comes from that query when you feed it through the translator. SDB translates the incoming Sparkle queries to a custom schema designed for storing RDF and then sends it off to the database over JDBC. So the idea was to be able to reuse all that database technology, query optimization, um, administration, security, transactions and all the other stuff that databases have in them by, by doing this translation. We've done a previous one um, that's actually still in, in Jenna called RDB, um, which had a much simpler schema but didn't perform so well. Uh, this is another schema trying to increase the scalability things. Uh, and, and, uh, and from that point of view, it succeeded. I mean, it's SDB scales a lot better than, than RDB and has better performance. And it actually has quite a good bulk data inserter as well, which was, was done by Damien Steer. However, the, this is also capturing the, the trouble there is in using SQL from the outside. So this is trying to be completely neutral as to which SQL engine is underneath it by having a sort of hands-off relationship with it by using JDBC to send the requests over and to send SQL 92 queries over to, over to the other end. But it, it shows the tension there is between, uh, between RDF and, and the relational model. I mean, it is a, ta a triple table, a single table of um, integers for SPO and then a mapping from the integers into what their lexical form is in another table. And they don't mind, uh, people talk a lot about self-joins causing databases grief. Now, it's true, there's a lot of indexing on the tables and it, you do end up with quite large databases, but the query optimizers do a fair job on, on, on so, um, self-joins self, self index, uh, shelf joins on that table. And the performance is okay. Where you lose out is the fact sometimes you need to make several calls to the database to do one query and JDBC round trip times start to build up and you actually get so a lot of latency. You end up, you get a slow query, but neither machine is actually doing very much work um, because you're sending it off to the other end. Um, also, we've loaded hundreds of millions of triples into it, but it, it kind of it wasn't as fast as really we would have liked. Um, so this is where, where the idea for TDB came along, which is a kind of, in the same way that the no SQL movement is trying to take out all those bits from SQL engines that, that, that kind of add to the cost, TDB is that kind of minimal stripped down version of, of a a storage system to support specifically to support Sparkle. So SQL databases, unless either you're going to get right inside the engine and, and really understand how to map Sparkle onto whatever your internal representation of the SQL is, which is the approach that OpenLink are taking because they're, they're not they've got a, a, an engine that they've got XQuery for, they've got SQL for, and they've got Sparkle for. Or you're going to have specialised parts of the database to actually support RDF, where it's much more in the style that Oracle have. Um, and both those work. What doesn't work is having this hands-off relationship and working over the JDBC connection. If you're going to go for the, you know, 100, the billion triples, if you're going to go you know, much over the 100, 100 million um, without excessive amounts of either hardware or, or something else to make it all work out. Um, 
The other thing is it's a lot of those costs get in the way. You, you can't really put UIs particularly conveniently over, over SD, but you're in danger that all those round trips are getting into reaction time of people actually moving around web pages. Um, UI workloads don't like, like the thing taking several seconds to come back. It just ruins the, the experience. A lot of data is non-transactional. A lot of data is for publishing to drive in as much more read-only that's behind it. We're not trying to do OLTP apl applications in RDF. Um, so by removing that transactional thing, all the costs that go to you know, keeping multiple copies of the data so transactions can be rolled back, um, locking on the things can, can, can be slimmed down uh, greatly. The other thing is to exploit features of modern computers. Um, so TDB does run on 32-bit hardware. It's much better on 64-bit hardware. It uses memory map files extensively. Um, and then the operating system is doing all the paging and deciding what's cached. And, and that's a part of the operating system that has had a lot of work done it, uh, over the years to tune it for all sorts of workloads. So it's reusing all that, any, um, all, all the stuff that's in Linux or Windows to actually um, to do that management of, ca of caches um, with tune so they're stable. They don't, if you do scans over them, they don't throw out all the data and um, start a game from scratch, which a, a naive LRU store um, will do if you do a really, really silly large query with just trash everybody else using it at the same time. So this is kind of, it's, the design is it, it, it's actually quite similar in some ways to, uh, to SDB. This is the triple version. There's a quads version as well, but just adds extra columns. You've got this is the triple table, except you only have the indexes. You don't actually store the triples because the, the indexes have, have enough information to actually reconstruct the triple. And so in the SPO index, you have the, the number for, for the subject, the number for the predicate, the number for the object, and it points into an object table, which has the lexical forms um, for that. And then you index it three ways for SPO, POS, and OSP. It, that's not the only combination. There's, there's, there's two ways of doing it, depending on what effects you want. Um, TDB also inlines integers, decimals, date times, and dates. In other words, the, these are 64-bit numbers, um, and it takes the value and actually puts it inside the node ID, so there isn't an entry in the node table. That means that when you do filters saying find me all the things less than five, you're doing CPU cost to do the less than five, rather than going off to disk and reading in the lexical form and seeing if it's a number and, and, and putting it in the parser. So there's no disk I.O. and there's no parsing overhead on every single operation. You're just getting the binary straight out of the, uh, out of the entry in the table. And if it's out of range, by the way, it just falls back to putting in the in the um, so if you had a really big integer I think uh, I think it stores up to 56 bit integers at the moment so if you had a 128 bit number um, it'll go and put it in the table it'll go slower it's functionally correct in, in slower um, dates it, it does um, from the year 0 to the year 8000 I think in uh, with time zones down to the resolution of um, a millisecond or something like that just working out how many, how many bits you need to represent the number. Uh, so it, but it never loses the precision. If it, if it can't encode it exactly in the, in, the, in the space available, it falls back to the more general mechanism. The indexes are actually now B plus trees. The original version was a B tree. They're about 100, 100 way. The blocks are actually 8K. And the smart on internal optimizations for, for range scans, they're custom written for, for T, the B plus trees are custom written for TDB. I did go around trying to find uh, B tree packages from other people. It proves quite difficult to actually find a standalone high quality B plus tree. I mean, there's ones in Derby. There's there's B trees in, in there's B trees in Sesame. There's B trees in a lot of the Java databases that would be usable, but they're they're integrated into the code base of each of those systems. Um, and if you're going to take a copy of that data, you're not going to get all the benefits of them doing the maintenance on it. So the the, the in the end, I ended up writing my own. There's a few freestanding packages, but they tend to be much more in the um, uh, examples or for low performance. And the one thing I did want to be a, to do is split the B tree algorithm from the mapping onto onto disk blocks, because that's where it decides whether it's going to do the way it does it for 32-bit or the way it does it for 64-bit hardware and uh, exploit memory mapped I/O. And there's also a, an, an optimizer for Sparkle queries that does basic graph pattern optimization.
just a few bits on, on different. It is sensitive to what hardware it's running on and, and it has a look around it when it, um, on boot time. If you're on 64-bit, it uses memory map files. It, it allocates, it uses space in, in 8 meg chunks. So you don't, um, and it, you get this really weird effect that you look, if you run top on, on a running instance, you see it has a process size for 150 gigs or something like that. It's because it's actually worked out of the entire files and they're all mapped into memory. They're not in memory, they're mapped into memory, <laughs> but it does mean you, can, you say people going, oh, but, but my only skew of a heap size of one gig. Yes, you did. <laughs> memory map file size doesn't come out of heap. So it, it, it look, it can look, at the first glance, uh, looking at the top listing for that, it, it looks bizarrely big, but it isn't really. The resident set's a lot smaller. On 32-bit, you can't play this trick because you need to be able to do Java addressing over the entire length. On 64 bits, no problem. In 32 bit, you're limited to actually to 31 bits um, of, of addressing in Java, 2 gig. Um, there's a little bit, there's a chunk taken out to, to give them to the JVM to work. Um, JVMs can't go over 1.2 or 1.5 gig. Um, and since if you're taking memory map files into that space, you're comp you run out of space, and even on quite small databases, very quickly. There's a, um, a simple LRU cache, and it does it in a more traditional style of actually reading into the in 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 heap cache. And you can tr now control the size of the cache a little bit. For 32-bit, it really only services one database at a time. On on 64-bit. Um, um, it'll open as many databases as you like and just rely on the operating system to do the resource control. Um, which also has the nice thing is on 64-bit, if the machine's idle and there's no other processes around, um, the operating system will give you more, more of the real memory to do, do the caching and as other processes fire up and need space, the usual paging stuff happens and your process gets less of the machine and then when those processes stop, it, you, know, you expand again and it, it nicely load balances. But um, so on, on the 32-bit one, it's more of a fixed size. It's taking a chunk of the machine and then, and then running with it. You can get some. You can get some bad bad effects. But um, uh, it's kind of you're only getting to those bad thrashing situations because somebody's taking the care to try and resource balance across different processes. The 32-bit case, the entire thing blows up and crashes. Yeah. If, you, if, you stress, if you were to stress it in, this, in doing the same sort of way, either you expand to the point where the Java machine says, no, that address is out of range, or, or um, uh, your machine just hasn't got enough, enough resources to satisfy oh, the request. Very, you don't have very explicit control anyway, right? No. JVM. And there's a bit of a catch on Windows. You can't, you can't delete memory map files from running processes in Windows. Bulk loader. The bulk loader is not playing any, any, it doesn't have any magic, but it does know that if you perform operations in a particular order, you get a lot of cache benefit. So when you're loading data in, it's only building one of the indexes. It, it loads the SPO index, but that means all of RAM is devoted to keeping that index cached. Um, so you've got good access to that until you completely overflow it, and, and then it builds each of the others sequentially. Because even on a even on a multi-core machine, it's better to do one index at a time. Devote the RAM to caching the tops of those B trees for that one, and use all of the RAM for those ones, rather than thrashing building two indexes at the same time. It's a fact. It can be a factor of ten different quite easily. Do all of one thing, move on to another. It's more of a batch style of update. No, this is this is. Disk, disk against RAM caching, not 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 L1, L2 level level caching. You do, it's just more efficient. You don't get thrashing. Disks are like well, disks are what a million times slower than fast of an L1 cache. Sort of yeah. It's entry. Well, we the best performance is loading from entriples. So there's a rule-based optimizer. There's also a tool for producing the files. You don't have to hand code the rules yourself. Um, this is actually produced by that tool. If you know the frequencies, this is um, from a sample of Music Brains, if you know the frequencies of um, the, the predicates, you can um, choose better orders for basic graph patterns. Right. Query optimization is a matter of avoiding lots and lots of false positives. So, uh, false negatives, doing too many negatives in the query. Um, trying to find a pattern where because it doesn't change the overall answers, but it changes the amount of work you do finding things and then not using them later on. That's really the search problem that it's trying, trying to do. Um, uh, it's a good idea to run with at least some kind of uh, rule file for the optimization. The performance differences are quite, um, uh, 
quite stark. There is a fixed algorithm which which is data independent that it, that is built in, which does it does a fair job actually. It's not too bad. The one thing not to do is run it with absolutely no hints, because if you write um, X's of type RDF resource and then something else, well everything's of type RDF resource. It's going to look in the database for that and lots of things will have have that as its uh, uh, as its type so it'll do lots of work churning through all those when then not not they wouldn't match the later parts of the query data sets so tdb is a quad store um, actually it's a triples and a quad store there's a triples in set of and triples indexes for the default graph and then a set of indexes for the for the name graphs you can treat all the name graphs as the union uh, the default graph is actually the union of all the name graphs if you want to. That really does work very well because then you can manage parts of your data but with named graphs yet query all of them at the same time. The, or you can query it, find something and then go and find, ask well which name graph did that actually, does that actually occur in? So you can do sort of provenance like um, uh, effects in Sparkle. What's a little bit different is that's not the only mode that TDB works in. You can also do dynamic collections of graphs. So you can use from and from named in the Sparkle query to select particular graphs from your, your database that you want the query to run over and it'll ignore all the other graphs in the database. So you can do um, selection from a set of things. In. So whereas normally in ARC that goes out and pulls those graphs in over the web, it's actually used in TDB to, to choose particular things within the data set. Last little bit, there is some variations of TDB. Um, one I've done is uh, you, instead of using the um, Sparkle, uh, the, the custom B plus trees to use or, um, Oracle's Berkeley DB, the Java edition for the indexing, um, that um, isn't as fast, but it has better concurrency when you're doing updates and reads at the same time. It allows one active reader as well as um, uh, sort of one active writer as well as readers, in fact multiple writers, providing you don't get lock contention. Um, whereas um, TDB with the native form says you can either have a writer writing to the database or multiple readers, but you can't mix them at all. So high concurrency is possible in, in the presence of updates using that one. Um, it will be possible to put um, BDB transactions underneath it. That's not done, but um, that data um, that index manager is transactional, so it would work and, and put lightweight transactions back into that uh, things. If somebody wants to do that, that would be really great. Um, I, I don't have any plans to do that. Um, I would like to have a go at doing the C version as well to see what the performance differences are. Um, so this is the last bit, which is kind of incidental to TDB, but quite early on you found that actually the slowest bit in my loading pipeline was the parser, which is kind of annoying when you're writing to a disk because that should be the that should be the bottleneck. So I did. I got sidetracked by working out why, why all that was. So there is actually a set of new set of parsers coming along for entruples and turtle, but also for nquads and trig formats, the name graph formats that are um, most often used. Um, and they also do a lot more checking than the current ones in Jenna. Um, it's nasty when databases get bad data in them, it's very difficult to find it and fix it. It's much better to trap it, stop it getting in on the, in, on the first place. So these are all bad literals. So this is not an XSD integer because ABC is not legal for an XSD integer. That is not an XSD integer, it's got a comma in it, you're not allowed commas. Um, that is not a date. That's not the right, that's not the format used in, in, in the XML schema. Um, it also does URI checking. Now. There's less of a sense of right and wrong because there's kind of two levels in the IRI standard. There is the syntax stuff about this is what they look like, but there's also some recommendations about this is not a good thing to do. So it's recommended for if you're canonicalizing not to use uppercase for DNS names because otherwise the uppercase version and the lowercase version, despite being the same DNS entry, are, are technically different uh, IRIs which doesn't help when you're doing comparisons or loading data to be the same. This one's just straight illegal because it's got a space in it. Spaces are not legal in IRIs. They are legal in certain RDF references. This is not recommended because you've used the default port. But, it already, that's, but that's implied by that. So whether that is or isn't present means uh, whether it will be um, compared to be the same as strings, which is what IRI comparison does in, in the database. So the um, RFC 3986 recommends against that. 
This one is illegal, it's got square brackets in it. Square brackets are only legal in the domain name part as a, a syntax for IPv6 addresses and they're not legal anywhere else. This one comes up quite a lot in converted data from library domains or um, from content stores. They seem to very often have square brackets in it and it produces illegal names, illegal IRIs. And the worst problem is you get those kind of bad IRIs into the database and everything works because they're just strings. It's, it, at the lowest level it's doing a lot of you know, string comparison or canonicalized string comparison. Um, but then you try and turn it back into say IDF XML and send it off to some other system and it blows up when you try and get the results out of your database. So it looks like you've got a bad query but in fact you've got bad data. And, and, and the problem manifests itself much later. You know, you could, you could have loaded that data months or years ago. Um, and that's where the problem actually arose. And standard web servers don't throw in you know, on the square brackets. No bar on the Web browsers um, will do the conversion behind your back. They'll, they'll turn them into the percent form. Uh, and then um, some of them, it seems to reverse the process now as well on the way back. If you, if you get redirected yeah. somewhere, yeah, and they, they, they cover it up for you. But uh, strictly, it's illegal. What's done with it in, uh, in V6? Uh, the domain name? Uh, if you used it in here, right. then you can put the 128 bit number that's the IPv6 network address. That's how you oh, tell it, yeah, the for the actual number. It's the syntax. That's the syntax yeah, this, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. before you move this to our TDB, it checks for all these. Yeah, yeah, it's still doing streaming, so you can you can set options. Usually, it just throws the triples away and doesn't load them. Um, but you can um, you can actually throw. But the trouble is, if you throw an exception, it's doing streaming base load. You've got a half loaded database at that point. The best the best practice is to parse all your data first to make sure it's clean, and then load it. If you've got it from someone else, give it a once over first to make sure it's clean. Yeah. Yeah. The, so that's sort of like a validation. Yeah. Yeah. What are the validators that are good in terms of validating your data? They're just sort of available. XML and NLPs. Just a, so whether you've got well formed XML coming in or. So W3C runs some validators for RDF XML. Is that what you, you mean? Yeah, yeah there's a validation service. Yeah, there's a, they've got a validation service for RDF there. They're, they're remote, they can get executable so you can run locally. Because they, they did it as a web service. No, theirs is a web service. It's actually running um, Jenna behind the background. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. It still has a validator, too. Um, it's got an RDF XML parser that's fairly picky in that sense. Yes, it has a validator. Yeah. Um, there's a validator for Sparkle online in, in GISSEC as well at sparkle.org. So, so I think that I uh, understand the pellet people have this notion of being able to declare now my data is complete and checking the consistency of the data against say an RDF schema or an L schema. Yeah. Uh, do you have any thoughts or plans in that kind of area which is more of a database like or XML like validation? I think they've done a good job I'd use theirs. I mean oh, okay. we're not, we're not you know, it's, you, that's another tool set Generally, isn't isn't everything you need? It's not. It, it's a set of it's a set of facilities. You're going to have to combine it with other things. Pellet, pet the pet, It's not. It's called um, ICD, isn't it? Um, it's something like that. You have to use that. So uh, okay, another uh, question for inference data. Uh, is there are there controls over that gets persisted or whether that gets calculated? So it gets, it gets calculated and stored in memory at the moment. So you can access the derived graph and then store it, either with, with your there. You can, so you can manually persist your inference data. We have a rules-based inferencing system, so we're not doing full LDL, for instance. There are some things you cannot write in rules for DL but around these junctions. If you do persist it, then you are responsible for validating it as well. Then yes, then yes, okay. yeah, yeah. I think that's it. That's just my rant about how to do Java input. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you.